Welcome to Three Books with Neil Pasricha, where each episode we uncover the three most formative books of an inspiring individual. I just press record. Hi, everybody. This is Neil Pastoreach, and welcome to a bookmark of free books. I haven't done a bookmark in a while. We've got the chapters, as you know, on every single full moon. We've got pages on every single new moon. A little, what are you laughing at? <laughs> it's just, you know, it reminds me of like the key drawer, you know? Like everything just gets thrown in there. It's no, so I, you. <laughs> there's an organization principle here chapters. There's 333 chapters, it's a thousand formative books total. And then we've got... There's always golden nuggets in the drawer. Yeah, I mean, like, if you drawer. find, like, a receipt you really need or, yes, like, that key yes, that you've yes. been looking for. You can't live without it. Let's put it that way. Uh, a parallel for the podcast. It's a good parallel for the podcast. Pages are a new thing we've been dropping in, which are morsels of past chapters. People are like, ah, you know, I have a five-minute commute, not a three-hour commute, blah, blah, blah. And then bookmark. I'm still doing bookmarks, people. This bookmark features my wonderful, lovely partner in life, Leslie. Here she is. Um, she joined us in Chapter 1, as you remember, the chapter with uh, 75 with Brené Brown, 79 with Kristen Neff, Rebecca the Sex Therapist. We had, you were a... Cat were and Nat. Cat and Nat. Uh, Voicemail to Dr. Laura Markham. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Dr. Laura Markham, when I went into Brooklyn, you left them. Which is kind of a perfect tie-in, because this book marks... Oh, you're in a feature role here, Les. Why? I want to release this, because I listened to it, and it was blowing me away, and I was like, oh, we got to release this on Three Books Feed. So tell us what, what we're about to hear. Yeah, well, last year I did a training with Dr. Laura Markham to become a peaceful parenting coach. And one of my colleagues, Diana, emailed me recently to ask me to speak at her online self-compassion. Sorry, 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 sorry. What's a peaceful parenting coach? What is that? Like? Oh, really? We're going to open that can of worms? Okay, okay, forget it. You're a peaceful parenting coach. Yeah, I talk about it in the interview. If, <laughs> if you're curious, okay. you're going to learn more. Um, and she asked me to be part of this self-compassion and parenting summit. And I mean, we hopped on Zoom to just have a call about what this was all about and I said to her like why me like how come you kind of know this little thing that I don't feel like I've really told the world that I have this secret passion for self-compassion and parenting and she was like are you kidding it oozes out of you like just even in being in the classes with Dr. Laura Markham online last year I could tell that that was a interest of yours and you try to support other parents to be more self-compassionate so she and we did an interview and we had a really good conversation and I feel like there's some good little nuggets and lots of vulnerability, and so it's exciting to share it in this way too. So who can who should listen to this? Who should who can benefit from this? Uh, yeah, parents. It's definitely like tailored towards parents, but I think also anybody who's interested in self compassion and how self compassion can play a role in how you can increase your impact, increase your emotional generosity to the people around you, stay regulated in important emo um, relationships, whether they're at work or at home. Hopefully it has something to offer lots of people. And it had something to offer me, and I think it'll have something to offer lots of people. I'm proud to release it as a bookmark uh, on the Three Books feed. And uh, check out the show notes both underneath this. Underneath this, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's on the YouTube video. If you're not watching this on YouTube, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the whole thing. I'm starting this as an experiment and video here. And if you're not on YouTube, if you're on Spotify, if you're on Apple, just check the links. We'll link, obviously, to everything that's mentioned and to our beautiful host who's letting us like repurpose this on our feet. So perfect. Thank you everybody for listening. And now without further ado, to the bookmark. Hello everybody, welcome. I'm Diana Yokley, your host and founder of Delight in Parenting. And I'm really excited to be interviewing Leslie Richardson today. Leslie is a mom, a teacher and facilitator and a peaceful parenting coach. Leslie has a passion for connecting deeply bringing people together, creating community, and building empathy. She studied psychology, drama, and education at Queen's University and has additional qualifications in special education and guidance counseling. It is the dualities of the wholehearted, bittersweet um, reality of being an imperfect human that she loves the most. Welcome, Leslie. So glad to have you here today. Thanks so much, Diana. It's lovely to talk to you and be here in this summit. <laughs> Yeah, it's exciting. The topic of self-compassion, I know, is near and dear to both mine and your hearts. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what brought you to uh, really value um, and work with your um, clients on self-compassion, building up that kind of inner resource? For sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've my whole life, I've loved working with children. I've loved talking about kids, parenting, teaching, anything like that. I, I started a little like day camp for my cousins when I was 12 years old. And 
I just thought that I was going to like rock being a mom and it was going to be so easy. And I was going to have all this experience in my bank. And then I had my first son and I realized Mm -hmm. it's hard to be a mom. And it brought up all these big emotions inside of me. And, you know, I had experienced really painful breastfeeding with him and needed to tap into some resource of compassion for myself through that experience, because Mm -hmm. it was just so much harder than I imagined Mm -hmm. it being. And I felt like nobody'd really ever talked about that. And so my love for self-compassion and parenting and for just connecting deeply Mm -hmm. one-on-one groups with other moms came from like a need inside of myself to just really feel seen and to normalize some of the suffering that that exists in Mm -hmm. in parenting, for lack of a better words. Um, So I saw in my work as a teacher how connecting in groups, like, you know, I ran in these grades seven and eight, um, basically self-compassion, we called them kids helping kids manage stress groups, but they were groups Mm -hmm. where students were able to talk vulnerably about the hard parts of their lives. And we, as the adults in the room, stayed quiet and the other adolescent children empathized and shared and related Mm -hmm. and everybody tapped into what we, you know, what we know in, in our knowledge about self-compassion, which was, was the, you know, universality of, of suffering, the common humanity. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I was sitting there seeing how powerful it was for students to connect with each other. And I was like, I need this as a mom. I need this as a mom and other moms Mm -hmm. need this because Mm -hmm, I was just mm -hmm. so kind of unsatisfied by talking about like, which sippy cup are you using? Or does your baby yeah. sleep tonight? Like I wanted to talk about how we were steering the ship of humanity and how right. we were parenting <laughs> ourselves and all of this deep, you know, intellectual and emotional work of being a mother. And so I created these mothers groups. They're called Mama to Mama. And they just are mothers coming together, talking about the real deep, feelings and thoughts that come up as we parent. And through that, I could feel that it was something that I needed and other parents need as they parent. And it allowed me to like tone my own self-compassion because so naturally I felt compassion for all these other mothers sitting before me. And it made me realize that I'm just as deserving of that compassion. And so Mm -hmm. through those groups and through my own individual journey, you know, in therapy and with a listening Mm -hmm. partnership and my own like path of enlightenment, I feel like I've just toned my ability to be Mm -hmm. compassionate towards myself. And am I done? Am I an expert? No, like we're all on this journey trying to become more and more self-compassionate each day or tone our, you know, our vagal tone, if you want to use the the medical mm-hmm. or psycho, the, the real physical terms. Um, so it's just become kind of a, a passion of mine and something that feels very, very mm-hmm. important and necessary on this journey. Mm-hmm. As a I love that. I love that you talk about kind of the group setting and the common humanity. And I want to definitely come back to that. But to start, I was wondering if you could kind of define for our audience what self-compassion looks like and maybe an example of what this sounds like. Because I think so often we're told like, kind of these concepts in, in maybe doing parenting a little differently, but we need like a role model. We, we need to understand like what the word, like what are the words we say to ourselves? What does this feel like? What does this sound like? Maybe you can kind of walk us through what a self-compassionate sure. moment looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I think of self-compassion as being necessary in parenting in two ways, both preventatively, like we're kind of like mm-hmm. preemptively and then mm-hmm. in the moment. Um, then maybe the in the moment sometimes ends up being like after. But I would actually, there could be three after the fact, but let's just uh-huh. do those, those two because those are the ones uh-huh. that I think are, are when it's most important. So preventative, preventative self-compassion means that you are caring for yourself all the time as a person deserving of love. Um, you are just giving this loving gaze towards yourself. And, you know, Kristen Neff would talk about this as the tender self-compassion so that you're caring for yourself like you would Mm -hmm. your own child or a dear friend. You are really, um, you know, small little things like just staying in the shower an extra few minutes and like feeling Mm -hmm. how nice the water feels on your body or um, treating yourself to getting into bed and watching that show that you love rather than feeling like you really should stay downstairs and keep Mm -hmm. organizing your kitchen. I don't know, just, Mm -hmm. just being loving towards yourself. And I think as moms, we're so good at doing that for our children. 
and we aren't as good at doing it for ourselves. So we could think right now of like 10 ways we could do something loving towards our child today, right now. Um, and it's harder, even as I'm trying to think of a real example, it's harder to think of the ways that we can be loving towards ourselves. But it's thinking like every single day in the small little moments, what do I need right now and how can I give it to myself? Um, honoring what you need before you feel the frustration or mm-hmm. rage or disappointment when your needs weren't met. So it's even looking at your calendar and noticing that there's um, mm. going to be a day after school where you have one kid going one direction, another kid going the other direction, and your partner coming home late, and you're going to need to have a grandparent or a babysitter come over that afternoon. And you're then being loving towards yourself, realizing where your limits are. And so I really think that there's a lot of like planning. There's there's both this like warm, tender love, and there's also logistical planning uh, in supporting how mm-hmm. you're going to be supported to the best of your ability. So that's kind of a, a little bit maybe more like practical than how some people yeah. talk about self-compassion, but I think it's a really important part of, of that self-compassion piece. And then the other part is in the moment. So, mm-hmm. you know, in peaceful parenting, we talk about the first and foremost strategy to being a peaceful parent is your own self-regulation. And I believe that you kind of can't regulate your own emotions unless you're being loving Mm -hmm. towards yourself in the same way that you can't ask your child to regulate their emotions unless they're feeling connected to us as their parent. We are adults, Mm -hmm. we have a fully developed brain. And so we actually need to offer ourselves the connection that we need, the love that we need in order to to self-regulate in a tricky moment. So um, Dr. Laura Markham uses the phrase, stop, drop, breathe. Um, And I would really say that self-compassion is integral in that in that mm-hmm. moment of a of a challenging parent inter- parenting interaction with your child. So, you know, let's say last night at dinner, my son spilled his second cup of milk on the floor and everybody seemed to be talking all at the same time. It was loud. It was busy at the dinner table. And if I wasn't using self-compassion, I would have like jumped right into, ah, why did you spill another cup of milk? Oh my God, this is so annoying. Now I'm cleaning this up and please stop yelling at me. And you know, like that, you know, traffic Mm -hmm. controller Mm -hmm. that we sometimes get into as parents. Um, But being self-compassionate meant that there was just a tiny little pause, a tiny little breath, that stop, drop and breathe, where I actually said inside my head to myself, like, wow, this is an overwhelming moment. Like there is now Mm -hmm. a second Mm -hmm. glass of milk on the floor. You worked so hard today to, um, you know, set everything up for this lovely family dinner on the second week of school here in Toronto. And, you know, everybody's sitting around the dining room table and you're hoping for a lovely connection with your family. And now you're on your hands and knees cleaning up another (laughs) milk milk and everybody's yelling. This is a hard, (laughs) and it is just those, you know, those three tenants that Kristen Neff talks about in mindfulness, self-compassion, that it's, being mindful of what the emotion is, that mindfulness. So overwhelm was the emotion that I was feeling. And then kindness, being like gentle and warm to yourself in the way that you would to your child or to a dear friend. So saying like, you know, one of my favorite lines is how human of you. I say that all the time. How human of you that this is overwhelming. Like look around. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a laugh kind of comes to my mind of like, look at this kitchen right now, like how chaotic it is. And no wonder Mm -hmm. you're overwhelmed how human of you and just being like warm and kind towards myself. And then that uh, common humanity piece as well. So saying like, here I am on this floor thinking about every mother in the history of time who has filled up. has never, you know, like (laughs) in honor of it's like, I am not alone here. (laughs) I am part of you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Like I am with every woman that has parented (laughs) <laughs> um, throughout history and right here in this moment on my hands and knees, like humbled yet again by the magnitude of this job being a mother. And all of that internal dialogue happens in like a split second, right? It really, we don't have the time to turn away from that spilt milk on the floor and go and do a 20 minute meditation to tap into all of that. It's like literally a split second. But I, if I, if I could slow down my thoughts to try to explain it to somebody that's what's included in that moment where I stop drop and breathe and I and I go through those three components of mm-hmm. self-compassion and in doing so I'm then able to be like oh my goodness <laughs> you know okay let's get this milk cleaned up like everybody just stay mm-hmm. in their seats that was bikes like there were bikes going through the milk like it was just- <laughs> and um maybe from the outside nobody would have seen the 
the like loving posture that I was in towards myself Mm. in that moment, but it was necessary in order to be loving towards my toddler right after. And so I was like, okay, you know, grab my husband to pull the bike off and grab the cloth to clean up the milk. And I'm thinking all those thoughts in my head. And then I'm like, woo, okay, here we go. Everybody back to the table. Let's try that again. And we got Uh back to the uh table and we continued our conversation. And so there wasn't anger and there wasn't rage and there wasn't frustration towards my child. I was emotionally regulated because I was compassionate towards myself. So Mm -hmm. that's how it really plays a role in the moment. And I think that the preventative and the in the moment are very interconnected because had I not done the preventative and the preemptive type of self-compassion, I don't think I would have had them as much access to, um, to it right then in the moment. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, I definitely want to come back to the preventative piece and a little bit more in the moment as well. Um, I know you mentioned there's the possibly a third piece, which would be after. Do you yeah, want to so kind sure. of, yeah. I'll go, I'll go to that as well. Um, and I think, you know, I know, I imagine that we will talk about this now or in more depth, but one of the pieces, mm-hmm. one of the times when the most tricky self-compassion and the most important self-compassion comes up is when we've made a mistake as a, as a parent, you know, or when we've, we've let ourselves down or let our children down in the way that we mm-hmm. want to be peaceful and we want to be loving and we want to be compassionate to both ourselves and to them. And when we fall short of that, and we all fall short of that, I fall short of that. You know, I have uh, my own emotions getting ready for this call with you thinking like, how can I talk about this peaceful parenting and this self-compassion when like I too, you know, fall off mm-hmm. and, and and lose track of um, this way that I want to be in my family. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that's when we need to call on that self-compassion in the aftermath, mm-hmm. in the repair, you know? And I think again, like I said, within the moment, the self-compassion has to happen before we can reconnect with our child. So um a repair conversation for me really begins with a conversation with myself and it, and it goes through those same three tenants that we're using, right? It's like a, you know, I'm disappointed in myself or I'm feeling some shame. That's when that's Mm -hmm. the hardest one, right? When that shame comes up. And I think that Mm self-compassion is the antidote to shame and, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and self-compassion is like, shame is the worst feeling. Is it not the worst feeling? Shame tells us that like, I am a bad person because of the way that I acted. And I am on a lifelong journey to not allow myself to go there because I am a good person. I am a good mom, just like my children are good people. And if I offer them the same Mm -hmm. understanding and support and compassion, then I have to offer myself that same understanding and compassion and support both for me and for them, because how are they ever going to learn to live shame-free lives if I am shaming myself? It just doesn't, it doesn't, Mm -hmm. it isn't helpful. So I believe that it's important to have regret and important to have guilt. (laughs) You know, these are emotions that can be productive. And some people think that self-compassion, you know, just means that we love ourselves no matter what. And I don't think that it does. I actually think that self-compassion is necessary to allow us to move into action. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I remind myself after I mess up, after I lose my cool on my kids or um, yell instead of being calm, um, I remind myself that I must need some more love. You know, like that's the first thing, like I must need some more love. So do I need that preemptive self-care, self-compassion, more support? Um, Do I need to like go back and work on processing something that happened for me when I was a child? Like what was I not allowed to fight with my siblings. And that's why it's so triggering when my kids fight with each other. I try to be soft and gentle towards those feelings inside of myself and give myself that tender love. And then again, it's, it's that Kristen Neff, the expert on self-compassion talks about fierce self-compassion, right? So it's also like a, I cannot allow this to happen. Like it's a, it's a, it's a firm mama bear boundary on like on myself sometimes, you know, like I Mm -hmm. am not okay with the way that I acted And so I can't miss my nap tomorrow, (laughs) like whatever it is, or like I Mm -hmm. need a night by myself. I need to not be on bedtime or Mm -hmm. I, I need to call up a parenting coach and get some more support because I'm not resourced enough in that moment. Or I need to order takeout 
tomorrow night because it was just too much to do these three activities and try to be making dinner and try to be regulated with my kids. Or I have to turn my phone off during the day. So I'm not multitasking so that when I'm multitasking at night with, with everybody home and with my kids all coming home from school with all their stories and that's that's that I have more energy there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's this reflection piece, this self-compassion that I offer myself, both the tenderness and the fierce self-compassion that then allows me to move into a real authentic repair with my child. And mm-hmm. in that repair, I'm going to talk about my own self-compassion and that's where I'm going to teach my child to be self-compassionate mm-hmm. too. So I'm going to recognize that, you know, what I did was not okay. I'm going to resist. I talk about like the five R's of a good repair. So it's recognize, resist, responsibility, redo, reconnect. And so I recognize, like I say to my kid, you know, I know that I yelled at you and that was not okay. I resist the temptation to blame them, right? Like, mm, and it's I love that. that repair, but I, res- I, I resist the temptation to say like, but you weren't listening, you know, and that's, we all mm-hmm. want, it just makes it feel better. If you're like, well, it wasn't my fault that I yelled. It was your fault, but we resist mm-hmm. that. So I say like, I recognize that I was yelling and that was not okay. I do not want to yell. It is not your fault. Sometimes I even say out loud, like it was not your fault that I yelled. Um, I did not like that you were not listening, but most of the time I'm able to handle it when you're not listening. And today I wasn't Mm -hmm. able to handle it. And so that's Mm -hmm. my own Mm -hmm. responsibility. There's that third R. That's my own responsibility. It's my responsibility not to yell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do a redo. You know, can we like act that out again and see what happens? You know, I was asking you to brush your teeth to get ready for school. You weren't listening. I started yelling. That wasn't good. Woo, let's like, sometimes I even add a little bit of like humor in there. And that really helps with that reconnect too, right? That, that mm-hmm, feel, mm-hmm. fifth R is reconnect. So I pull them back in and I say like, let's just like rewind. And we do like our whole body going backwards. And I'm like, okay, ready? Here we go. Please brush your teeth to get ready for school. They're like, sure, mom. And we do this almost like, it's almost, <laughs> you know, pretend. We're acting. Uh It didn't feel good to them when I yelled. It didn't feel good to me when I yelled. And so we are able to redo. And, you know, I'm using a light example. Of course, sometimes there are those repairs with the really hard ones, the ones where it takes a couple of days sometimes for me to be self-compassionate enough towards Mm. to be able to really feel warm enough towards myself and therefore warm enough towards my own child (laughs) to be able Mm -hmm. to do a real authentic repair where it doesn't really always have laughter. It sometimes has a little bit more of that somber feel of, you know, admitting to the fact that all moms makes mistakes and I made a mistake and I really wish that I hadn't made a mistake. And, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I often find myself promising my kid that I will be compassionate towards myself, you know, and that's, Oh, I love that. I love that. Like I often end up saying like, I am going to take better care of myself. I promise you. And oh, like it makes me cry Mm because I think that the most important person we can mother is ourselves. Like we can't mother our kids unless we mother ourselves. And Mm. my hope in showing them that is that like self-compassion is the answer. So like, if you mess up, you need more Mm. self-compassion. And I'm like making that connection for them so that hopefully they grow up to be the type of, people that when they make mistakes, they're self-compassionate and then they hop back on track because we all do that. And we talk a lot about like, you know, we just, we hopped off track and now we're getting back on. And Mm -hmm. I remember reading somewhere about, um, like it was about an eating disorder, but it was saying, you know, living in recovery doesn't mean that you never show disordered eating behavior again. Mm -hmm. It actually means that you know your warning signs Mm -hmm. and that when you do relapse, you're able to forgive yourself, be self-compassionate and hop back on track sooner. And I feel like that's what I'm most proud of. Like, I cannot sit here and say like, I am just such a peaceful parent and I am always Mm -hmm. peaceful with my children. But when I mess up, I'm better at getting back on track. And I mess up less often because of that, Mm -hmm. because the shame spiral isn't there. Instead, the self-compassion spiral is there. And Mm -hmm. so- do preemptively mm-hmm. feed myself self-compassion. And I do more often than not use self-compassion in the moment. And then on the times when I don't, I use that third piece of the after the fact self-compassion to allow me to do a genuine repair with my child. I commit to the preemptive self-compassion. And through doing so, I then have less of those challenging moments to repair, to recover from. And so mm-hmm. I have therefore started to replace that shame spiral with the self-compassion spiral with it, which I think is kind of all we can hope for. We're not going to, 
we're not ever going to be perfect parents. Nobody is a perfect parent. And I think actually we would do a disservice to our children being parents that never messed up because then how are they ever going to manage messing up as adults? You know, I, I, Mm -hmm. one of my colleagues, another peaceful parenting coach had this great line that she says with her kids. I love it. Mishka Williams. And she said, um, when one of her kids, you know, (laughs) her fuffle, she called it, then, um, the kid will often come back and be like, oh, mom, like, sorry, I was just yelling at you. I shouldn't have yelled at you. And, and she'll be like, well, you know what? I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for not being perfect. Because if you were perfect, it would just be so much more stressful that I had to be mm-hmm. perfect. And like, woo, okay, we can all just forget about being perfect. It's not such a relief to live in a house where nobody's claiming to be perfect. And mm-hmm. I you know, like, what a gift to mm-hmm. give our children to remind mm-hmm. them that nobody's perfect and we don't have to be perfect. And Self-compassion is the most loving posture we can take towards our imperfections. Oh, I love all of that. You're really touching on a lot of the kind of um, elements that I wanted to highlight. So I really appreciate that. It really shows like your understanding and your real life experience with this because you see the nuances of this whole entire process and kind of where people get stuck and kind of how to work around those with kinks. Um, I wanted to highlight what you're saying essentially is that with the perfectionism piece and not being a perfect parent and self-compassion, the goal isn't to be never dysregulated and that's impossible anyway. But even if it was possible, the goal isn't that because that doesn't necessarily equal love. Self-compassion gives us an opportunity to exercise love really. And in parenting, what do we want most for our children, for them to feel our love and for us to love them, right? That is a different ball game. This love piece versus the perfection piece. Perfection is like absolutes hundred percent, kind of an evaluative system, yeah. but the goal in parenting isn't necessarily to uh, kind of walk the straight line. It's to show up with more love. And it's almost like when we mess up, it gives us opportunities to practice that muscle and to demonstrate for our kids even more when there's this connection, right? Exactly. I mean, Dr. Laura says that there's only ever two, everything happens for two reasons, out of fear mm-hmm. or out of love, mm-hmm. right? And perfectionism is fear. Like perfectionism, really, if we boil that down, it's like, I have to be perfect because if I'm not perfect, I won't be loved. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm telling myself that I have to be perfect, I'm telling my kids that they have to be perfect too. Whether I want whether I believe it or not, right? And mm-hmm. if we are able to really model and show to our children, I'm not perfect and I still love myself. I know I'm a great mom and I know you're a good good kid and we make mistakes. And in this family, we love each other with our ugly parts. Like that's the art of love. It's so easy to love someone on their great days, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Like, like, like same in marriage, right? It's so easy to love someone and they're like happy, you know? <laughs> dressed up beautifully or handsomely and like at a party I'm picturing just this like lovely perfect person and there's the word right there perfect person like presenting perfectly is what I mean Uh but to Mm -hmm. really love someone means to like see them when they're sick and to know their quirks and that's that that like that the art of loving somebody imperfectly is really so much deeper than mm-hmm. accepting somebody's beautiful, like just celebrating and accepting all the beautiful mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, yeah. yeah, like I, I use the idea of the North star, right. We, and mm-hmm. um, if anybody's looking for more support in this type of thing, I think one of the best resources out there is Dr. Laura Markham's peaceful parent, happy kids online course. And she has meditations that go all through it. And a lot of them are about self-compassion because we have mm-hmm. to take care of ourselves and be the most well versions as parents that we can be to be able to parent our children in this way. This is a type of parenting that takes a lot of resources and you cannot pour from an empty cup. And mm-hmm. um, oh, I lost my train of thought of where I was going, but just use, doing that. Oh, the thing, North Star, the North right, Star. That uh-huh. idea of the North Star, she talk, in her meditation, she talks about like, picture yourself as the most resourced, loving abundant, emotionally generous mother that you can possibly be. And like, what, what got you there? You know? And like, Mm -hmm. was it that you exercised that day? Was it that you had time alone? Was it, um, that you like hugged yourself and told yourself that you were deserving of love and really like growing. It is a muscle. It is a muscle Mm -hmm. to grow Mm -hmm. that ability to be loving towards yourself and hold yourself in this beautiful light. And as Mm -hmm. we envision that more, and as we practice that more, and as we give ourselves the tools that we need to feel that way, we become more that person. And then we are more able to walk towards that North star of being a loving, 
peaceful, self-compassionate, accepting of imperfections parent. And Mm -hmm. when we do that, um, the times when we fall off track become less upsetting because we're just like, oh, I fell off track. Now back to where I'm going because I know Mm -hmm. what that looks like. I know what it feels like. I It Mm -hmm. tastes so good. I can almost touch it some days. And I know I'm going to keep falling down. But when I do, it's so much easier to just hop back on on track and continue Mm -hmm. towards it. Mm, yeah, I love that. Um, and and I wanted to touch on you mentioned, you know, peaceful parenting and a lot of people, I think when they go into like learning about peaceful parenting or practicing it and there's other names for this work, right? Like conscious parenting, gentle parenting, all kind of in the same like, um, uh, you know, empathic parenting, relationship based, but also boundary setting and kind of having limitations around safety and stuff. Um, as we're talking through this, I'm drawing a lot of parallels about how we relate to our children as a peaceful parent, right? We connect with them. We emotion coach them through difficult times. We also set limits and boundaries around uh, behaviors, but always welcoming all feelings. And Mm -hmm. as you're talking through this, it really reminds me of how so many of our, so much of our energy goes towards the child. Um, And yes, while we know, like with the three big ideas, you know, self-regulation is the first step. I I often wonder like if we're under resourcing ourselves in that step because and we know like it comes first so you have to be calm so you can connect and emotion coach and set limits but um how much energy and how much like investment do we have in that part of peaceful parenting right because like I think most parents you know they come to parenting thinking it's about me parenting my child not about me parenting myself but like you said this whole reparenting Mm-hmm. You know, if you were to allocate, like, you know, if you had a hundred units for peaceful parenting, how much would you say, you know, go into uh, the child, what you give to the child and how much goes into what you give to you? Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know. It, it, it It's hard for me to break it down mathematically like that, because I think I, I feel as though it's more interconnected somehow, like yeah. uh-huh. in a way part of me could say like 50, 50, like you're just as important as your child. Um, but then of course there are moments where like, you know, your own reparenting journey has to be put to the side because you have a new baby and you're waking up in the night and you're like, you're just full on in, in parenting. And, um, sometimes one's active and sometimes one's passive and then they switch and they're just Mm -hmm. to me like so intertwined. And I guess, I don't know, I think I would almost think for me personally, and maybe it feels different for different people, but I feel like in my family, I am like tending to myself, my marriage and each of my four children in equal parts. Like, I feel like those are, Uh those are on my plate in equal amounts. And so Uh just like, I wouldn't pick one of my children that was more deserving of my love. I also wouldn't pick myself or them as being more or less deserving. I feel like it could I even say that like I am my own child too, you know, to go mm-hmm. to go that far. And in that in that reparenting speak, we often talk about like, you know, my little girl was feeling, you know, like that feeling of like, yeah, like I think, I think I show up as a child sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then I'm a mother to myself. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm also my my children show up as their children versions of themselves and how human of them because they are still children and I mother them too. And so, I mean, actually like what I'm saying reminds me of something that I, for me, self-compassion, one of the most, the easiest ways to access it is through my wise mother self. So I was just talking to a mom the other day saying to her that um, she was having trouble like hearing that wise, self-compassionate voice towards herself. And I know Kristen Neff talks often about like, you know, talk to yourself like you would a dear friend. And Mm -hmm. that that just wasn't quite like clicking. And I was like, can you talk to yourself like you do to your child? You know, like, can you be your most beautiful, enlightened, wise mother self to yourself? And that's, I think what that, like, I call it the wise voice or your self-compassionate voice or your loving voice sounds like is, you know, when, when one of my children comes home and they're crying about how they felt left out in a game at recess. And it's so easy for me to be like, oh my goodness, that must have just really hurt. You know, you wanted so badly to play that game and that person wouldn't include you. And they just like melt in my arms and they're crying. And it's this beautiful, empathetic, love-filled moment. 
like that's how I have to talk to myself sometimes is, is, is I, and I almost have to be both parts. And I've actually done that with my husband uh-huh. before too, in saying like, you know, I'll say to him like, Oh, I, I feel like such a failure in the way that I yelled at him today. Like, you know, I just really wish that I didn't do that. And he'll be like, Oh, don't worry about it. I'm like, no, that's not really what I need right now. And I'll say like, what I'm wanting you to say is, and I am able to tap into like the mother voice, like Mm. saying, oh, Leslie, like you, you lost your patience today. And there was a lot going on. And there was a second cup of spilled milk. And, you know, the bike was just about to go through the tire. And it's that same, you hear, it's like the same voice Mm -hmm. that I'm using Mm -hmm. for my child. It's that, um, you know, you just wanted things to go differently than they did. And they didn't go the way you wanted. And how human of you that you, that you felt overwhelmed in that moment and that you just couldn't hold it together. That happens to all of us. We all fall down sometimes and you want so deeply to be calm, even in the hard moments. And you weren't able to be today. And I'll say all that. And my husband will say like, Oh, well, if you like, I don't know if I can say that, but that's a lot like you as a mom. And it like, it's just really helped me realize that yeah, the self-compassionate voice is your like wisest, truest, most peaceful, conscious, loving parent voice. And Mm -hmm. if, if, if it works for you and, you know, we've got to say this so many different ways because different things work for different people. But if it works for you to think if you're, if it's easy for you to be loving towards your child, try to think about yourself like that little child that Mm -hmm. needs loving and see Mm -hmm. if that parent wise parent voice can be a way you can access that self-compassionate voice because that really works for me. Oh, I really love that. Yeah. And I almost see like kind of maybe two boot camps with parents, like you said, some that are, that are able to find that joy and delight in their child and empathy for their child in the tough moments. And so how can they borrow almost like borrow from that for themselves? And then maybe another a group of parents that struggle with being empathic and and connected sometimes during difficult times, especially, and they're here to seek out resources for self-regulation through self-compassion. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about kind of that second category of parents yeah. that um, yeah, that sure. don't have that already. So where I know I, I think of those two camps. It? Yeah, those two camps. Yeah. It's a really good point, and I think of those two camps of parents often also being like um, the parents that you know, so there's like this peaceful, conscious, loving parenting in the middle. And then some of us would veer towards being like more loving and warm and like maybe passive and like empathetic and allowing. And then some of us would veer the other way of being like a little bit more strict and cold and like maybe not as supportive. And, um, for me, I like, I veer towards that, like, just like loving until the end of time towards my kids. And it's harder for me to be like, you do actually have to make your bed. Um, but I think mm-hmm. you're right that there's that second camp of parents that go the other way and that are, um, yeah, a little bit like that, that fountain of love and empathy towards your child is a little bit harder. Actually, it reminds me that um, I confessed to Dr. Laura that her strategy, empathy 24 seven, just like stressed me out. Like I was like, like, okay, I'm trying to be empathetic 24 seven, but like, I think I'm empathetic, like 23 seven. And like, I feel bad about myself because I like veer towards that perfectionist and, you know, wanting to be empathetic all the time. And she was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, that is not how I mean it. I mean it to be, um, to try to use empathy most, you know, as much as we can. And uh-huh. some people, to mm-hmm. your point, that is harder. So for that, what I would recommend is, First of all, like what comes to mind first is spending some time like meditating on the beautiful baby that your child was and really still is. And like finding a picture from when they were little or a sensory memory, like the feeling of holding their hand when they were just a little baby or like Mm. the a tuft of their hair from their first haircut or like we're, we're just, it's so natural in us to, to feel that empathy and to mirror and connect and release all of those good love hormones when our baby is little. And so to find some way to access that side of yourself and to like meditate on it. And this is also really helpful for a partner. Um, I have baby pictures of my husband that I like look at when we're not getting along very well. And I'm like, he is just a baby deserving of my love. <laughs> and so, yeah, finding some way to like soften that the gaze at which we hold the people in our family, um, Mm -hmm. really like meditating on that and finding a way to access it in the moment. Um, Mantras 
are super, super helpful. I have them pasted all over my fridge. Um, you know, one of my favorite ones with my four boys who are always you know, debating which superpower they would have as calm as my superpower. Like I always say like, oh, if I could pick any superpower, I would definitely pick calm, you know, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. another one um, that might help the second camp of parents that we're talking about is, you know, my job to be calm, their job to be children. Um, Another way Dr. Laura says it is for as long as you have children living in your house, you're going to have people acting like children. Hopefully it's just children, you know, like that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Children do spill milk. Um, Children do kind of normalizing. And I guess that's part of that, you know, that mindfulness, self-compassion piece, again, that we can like blur into the way that we find compassion for our children is the universality of being a kid. Like kids are messy. Kids do have trouble regulating their emotions. Kids do fight with their siblings. Kids don't listen to every single request. Like that is normal. And maybe, so yeah, I guess I'm, I'm t- I said the meditation piece and then the normalizing the childish behavior. And then my next one would be like getting really clear on what you want from your children, like writing a list, I think, of what your goals are in terms of like, when I'm finished parenting them, how will I, mm-hmm. what will I be most proud of? Will you really be most proud of the fact that they were like compliant? I don't think so. Um, mm-hmm. I think on that list, you will have things like, being a good problem solver, um, <laughs> able to stay calm in a stressful moment, uh, able to forgive themselves and others, um, hardworking, uh, happy, peaceful, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. if, if you write that list of what you want and maybe in that second camp, I think sometimes people are very like logical and scientific minded. And so like reading the research and realizing that actually the way to get those outcomes is to be loving and peaceful and compassionate towards our children. Mm-hmm. I think there's a flawed, um, untrue memo that we sometimes hear from grandparents or society that, or like, you know, more old, I think it's dated parenting, but I recognize that I live in, in the bubble of being surrounded by people who are parenting in this way. Um, that thinks that, you know, if, if I don't get my kids to listen, they're not going to be, they're not going to be able to function as adults. Um, they're going to be entitled. They're going to be, they're going to misbehave, whatever. And like, that's not what the research says. The research says that when we do allow children to be children, when we offer them empathetic limits, when we model self-regulation, when we're deeply connected to them, they are healthier, more productive, higher functioning adults. And, um, so I think sometimes just yeah, like turning to the research, getting clear about what those goals are and and mm-hmm. realizing that the path to there <laughs> is empathetic limits. And then that gives you the motivation to do the the previous couple of things of to really get to that place where you can more freely flow empathy and love towards them. Yeah, I love that. And um, you know, as you're talking about, you know, giving them empathy and then, you know, setting limits on behaviors. You had mentioned earlier how sometimes we kind of have that um setting limit boundary with ourselves like that is not how i want to show up um so can we talk a little bit about basic like essentially like kind of this parallel of the way we're parenting kids using the peaceful parenting approach is kind of the inner child parent reparenting as well and you know how can we um um you know maybe even set limits with ourselves when we're uh, you know, but we know s- limits don't come first, right? There's this whole process. They're like the last thing in line. So what does that look like when we're being self-compassionate and we are behaving in a way that doesn't align with our values uh, as a parent? Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess, you know, that's similar to what we were talking about with those, like that re- repair type of self-compassion where we've uh-huh. like fallen off track. And um, I, I guess like, for me, it's really clear which in which ways I want to act with my children and in which ways mm-hmm. I don't. And if that's not clear for you, I think it would I think it would be a good exercise, just like we would mm. with our children, to determine what is allowed and what's not allowed. And does that mean we're gonna 100% of the time, you know, do all of those things that were allowed and not the things that were not allowed? No, but it's a, you know, I'm I'm actually picturing. Um, an exercise where you would like draw a house, you know, and you could do this with your children where you would draw a house and ha- right at the top, kind of like in our house, we, you know, and like inside of the house, um, problem solve together, 
offer forgiveness, um, speak respectfully, uh, you know, listen when someone's talking, clean up after ourselves, like whatever the, the things that you're working on as the family that you want to make sure that everybody's doing. And I think it is just as much for the parents as for the child, right? Like these are, right. these are the things that we and our family do. And uh-huh. I, I like talking to my kids like that, that like we're on a team. And I, sometimes I, I often find myself saying, you know, I work really, really hard to speak respectfully to you. And I don't find the way you're speaking to me respectful. You know, like this is a, this is a, a shared boundary. It's not, I can mm-hmm. yell at you, but you have to speak respectfully to me. Like we speak respectfully in our home. And so I think, yeah, you could write, draw that house and write the things that we do. And then on the outside, like we do not use put downs, name call, threaten, shame, right? Like, um, and those, those limits are for both of you. They're for you mm-hmm. and your child. And this shift towards looking at ourselves rather than just looking at our parents as a, our, ch- our children is a really hard one to do, but it is probably the most important shift you can make as a parent. And, um, you know, it's why in, in, you know, the Peaceful Parent Happy Kids work uh, course, one of the first activities is to make a no yell challenge for yourself as a parent, right? And like the goal is to get your kids to listen, but you're working on not yelling yourself. And I think that's just because we learn through modeling. Um, we pick up on the codes of what is allowed and what is not allowed in our family based on how our parents behave. And so if your kids aren't listening and your kids are yelling, although it's really hard to hear this and I feel like it makes, you know, it, I, I have the same like Ugh, reflection because my kids are sometimes yelling and not listening. I'm like, well, I must be yelling and not listening as much mm-hmm. as I would like to be like, <laughs> it, it does require that shift towards looking at yourself. And when you get really clear on what you want in your family, what you, and maybe one camp might be harder on themselves and one camp of parents might be harder on their kids. Right. And if we can kind of right. actually, maybe that's a really nice way of think of bringing us to that type of um, middle ground mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. this type of peaceful parenting, it's actually not one extreme or the other. It's right in the middle. It's lots of mm. support for kids and lots of support for parents and high expectations for kids right. and high expectations for parents. Neither one is getting off easy. And just like our kids are going to need lots of support, we're going to emotion coach them through hard moments. We too are going to need lots of support. And so we are going to need to actually like self-regulate ourselves, emotion coach ourselves, connect deeply with ourselves to be able to do it for our kids. And mm-hmm. Some of it will happen in private and some of it will happen right there with them. And that's how the code in your family will get set. Mm -hmm. Mm, Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's this very like kind of um, equal justice kind of um, uh, we all are on the same team too. And we also hold ourselves to high expectations of behavior, understanding sometimes when we slip up, we're here to also support each other. So it kind of reminds me also of like, leadership which i think of parenting really as leadership too and how we have to you know like a leader in an organization like a supervisor or a ceo or something like that not to get too like professional oriented but it's a similar concept like people want you to walk the talk like if you've ever worked for anyone you want your boss to walk their talk otherwise it's like well so i guess i'm the only one that has to follow these rules you're a, you're an exception to the rule exactly. and when they the do best leaders are the ones that are mm-hmm. right there following the same code as all the people mm-hmm. on the team. It's like that quote of actually like some of the best leaders are leaders we don't even know exist, you know? And if we want mm-hmm. our children to take on more responsibility, become leaders, be problem solvers, then yeah, we model it. And actually we like guide them in such a way that they start to, with enough scaffolding, like do it themselves. And mm-hmm. it ends up being this like beautiful coexistence. And they're, you know, Although, you know, my kids are still young. I have a nine, seven, five and two-year-old. And so like, they're not doing it all by themselves yet. But sometimes there's little glimmers of it where I'm like, wow, like this is the other day I was saying like, wow, the way you guys are playing, like it's music to my ears. It's the best sound I've ever heard to hear you guys Mm -hmm. problem solving and figuring out whose fort's going to be in which spot and how you can help each other. Like that is just the most amazing sound I could hear. And through doing through, I was really like, choosing to celebrate that because earlier that same day they'd been bickering and, you know, all over each other. And I was thinking about that great quote. That's like water, the flowers, not the weeds. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and that idea Mm -hmm. that when 
we like what we focus on grows. So when I was, I was trying to celebrate their really great playing and they like looked at me and they were like, Whoa, we are so proud. Like we are doing <laughs> And I don't even think that they noticed it was happening really naturally, but it's through a lot of practice and goes back to that, like, um, normalizing that, you know, sibling, I think sibling rivalry is often one of the very triggering things for parents. Yeah. And I was going to ask you a question about that next. I was going to say, what do, what do parents do when they're reacting? Like they're practicing. Kids fight. It's so yeah, hard. How... The kids are practicing getting along with other people, you know? And when I, and I, and I love your, your, your parallel to leadership in a corporation. I actually often call myself the CEO of my family. And I think that that is an important thing. It's, it's not just easy, unpaid, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm out of the office every Friday and you're a slave in a way. No, like it's not that. And I am a hundred percent confident that when I am a hundred years old in my rocking chair on my front porch, looking back on what I'm most proud of, it will be parenting. Like it will be Mm -hmm. the way that I parented my children and the humans that they grew in to be. Um, So yeah, when I, when I sip to talk about sibling rivalry, like I, I try to remind myself, this is not just like an inconvenience to me right now that they're bickering. Mm-hmm. This is them doing their most important work. The way that they are learning to navigate a human relationship with each other is how they will act in a job, how they will be in a romantic relationship, how they will navigate standing up to somebody who's disrespecting their boundary. Like they are practicing the most important work of life here. And when I put it into that, um, when I give it that much importance, it's a lot easier to stay calm and regulated myself and to like be resourced enough to be there for them in it. Because like, it's more important to me than pretty much anything else that they do. Um, I care more about the way they get along with each other. And that's why Mm -hmm. it's so triggering. Right. But right. it's it's worthy of my attention. It's worthy of our hard work. And it is hard work. And so when I like validate that, and I think that's the other whole piece about self-compassion, when we when we introduce self-compassion to parenting, we're admitting to the fact that it's hard. Cause we didn't like things that aren't hard don't need compassion, right? Like you don't <laughs> yeah. you don't like, yeah. you know, go up to a bride who looks totally happy on her wedding day and be like, I'm just gonna give you my compassion right now. Like, no, it's yeah. a happy yeah. Right. Right. And right. So being self-compassionate, it admits that there's hard in it. And mm-hmm. sibling rivalry is hard. It's hard on parents. It's hard on hard on kids. It's probably one of the most beautiful, rewarding, and challenging relationships in a child's life is with their siblings. So you want me to do an example of like how do you actually sure. you know, yeah, yeah, for the parent, and like, you, you know, the kids are bickering in the next room or maybe it's escalating and you hear some shouting. Somebody maybe had gotten hurt because okay. somebody else couldn't control their impulse. And now you're going to go in and try to calm right. it down. But you're feeling super triggered because it's your exactly. most important thing. Your kids getting along, right? I know. And it's so triggering because it's such a like clash inside of my heart when my two kids are fighting because I care so deeply about both of them at the same time that it like is like mom bear instincts time like, exponential, you know, like, yeah, it just, yeah, you yeah. Feel like you're going to explode. And so like in diesel parenting, it's always the three things. The first thing that has to happen is self-regulation. You cannot like go into that interaction escalated yourself. And like, sometimes we make it worse. Sometimes there's a fire and we just like pour gasoline on it. And right now it's two people <laughs> yelling. And then all of a sudden it's three people yelling you and your kids. So I think the first thing is that stop, drop and breathe. And as we practice it, we get faster and faster at it, you know, not needing to be like a full step away, but sometimes it is a full step away. Of course, if a child isn't safe, then we're going to try to break them up even when we're not calm in as calm as a way as we can. So let's say there's a four-year-old and a two-year-old on the carpet, like building with Lego and the four-year-old starts hitting the two-year-old because the two-year-old has knocked down the tower. Like, first of all, very normal moment. This is going to happen. Four-year-olds cannot Mm -hmm. hold back their impulsive desire Mm -hmm. to protect their tower. It's not a decision that they're making to hit their brother. It's just emotion, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Impulse. Um, so if we are totally escalated, um, and we worry that there's a safety concern, then we're going to go and we're going to, first of all, just like bring safety. So sometimes it might just be separating them and saying nothing. Um, sometimes you can, you know, if this two-year-old is 
small enough. Sometimes it's just scooping up one child and making physical space between them. And I often find it helpful to say like, you know, let's say they're fighting over the same, they're knocked down and they're fighting over the same piece. I often say something like, there's only one truck and there's two boys that want it. Uh Uh-oh, like, uh uh-oh, here we go. There's, There's only one truck and there's two boys that want it. And I'm just like stating what's happening and I'm physically giving space. Then I'm going to like take a deep breath. Here I am doing it, even just thinking about it to try to (laughs) bring myself to calm. And so I remember one of those mantras that I have posted on my wall. Maybe I even like glance over at it and I read that like my job to be calm, their job to be children. I'm thinking in my head, like this is going to get calmed down much faster if I can be calm and what they're doing is totally normal and totally Mm -hmm. understandable and acceptable. And I remind myself that this is important work. This is more important than finishing dinner or, um, you know, the email that I was trying to write. And I like, I put that to the side because it is going to require my full attention. And I find when I try to deal with sibling rivalry while doing something else, it never works well. So I like, I honor that it is requiring of my time and put the other stuff to the side. And that's self-compassionate, right? Like it's, I am one human being. I am not going to be able to like send off that important email and get dinner on the table and deal with this, this fight yeah, all the yeah. time. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I can only do one thing. And I sometimes like say that out loud, like, okay, hey, I'm going to turn off the stove and I'm going to close my computer because you guys need my help. And I mm-hmm. go back to the floor and I just calm myself down. And the most beautiful thing about co-regulation is that when you start calming yourself down, they start calming down too. And sometimes the tears start flowing and sometimes they keep yelling, but you just say like, Oh, this is really hard. And there's that mindfulness of self-compassion. It's all so interconnected. You can't untangle it. And you say, oh, this is really hard because there's just this one blue tower. And there's these two kids that both want you both really want it. You were, you were just building with it and you saw it. It looked so good and you grabbed it. And, and one of the ways like, and, and this might be helpful more when kids are older and it's, you know, an even more emotionally intense sibling fight, but I sometimes Mm -hmm. imagine myself being both child's therapist at the same time. And I Mm -hmm. like two things can be true at the same time. Both perspectives can be true. It's not, there is no picking sides and Mm -hmm. that's how we're going to show our loving support of both of our kids. So you can put one hand on both children. You can look both of them in their eyes, like saying to one child, you have been working so hard on this tower and you are building them all up and I can see you really worked hard to develop this pattern and you have it. And, you know, you're four years old and the Lego is usually something you get to play with alone. And, you know, and then it got knocked down. He knocked down your tower. Oh my goodness. That must just be so disappointing. And then you turn to the two-year-old and you're like, this Lego is sparkly and shiny and it looks so fun to play with. And your brother always gets to use it. And you're really hoping that you can get a turn, aren't you? And like, they're both true. Neither one. There's no shame. There's no blame. I'm not like saying, well, you took the tower from him. So give it back. You're a big kid. You need to be nice to your brother. And I'm Mm -hmm. using that self-compassion of like really keeping myself calm, honoring that this is a hard moment deserving of my attention. And I'm therefore able to be calm with both of them. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, often they calm down enough to often one of them will like suggest something that that should happen. If they don't, if they stay escalated and they're too upset to problem solve, then I say like, you know what? We can't problem solve when anybody is upset, you know? So we have to, we have to get ourselves calm enough before we can problem solve. And sometimes my kids will even say like, well, I'm calm enough to problem solve. And I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm still, I love that. I'm still really upset that so-and-so is bleeding or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I am not calm enough yet. And even now with my nine-year-olds and it kind of drives me crazy, but I say like, I'm going to need to bench this and talk to you about it later. Cause I'm just too upset. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think mm-hmm. we think that we have to like, that we have to do it fast, but that's another huge benefit of sibling relationships is we have time. Like the repair can happen the next day. And sometimes it's the most graceful thing to do to give it space. Mm-hmm. I mean, in my marriage, I have learned to go to bed mad. Like it is the worst yeah. marriage advice ever to not ever go to sleep mad, like go to sleep mad and Mm -hmm. deal with it the next day. It's going to be so much easier and you have time. And there, I, you know, I think we can learn in our, with ourselves in our marriages, with our children, how we can respectfully pause a conflict. Mm -hmm. We can say, Mm -hmm. you know, I am just feeling too hurt, too upset, too disappointed, too overwhelmed to talk about this right now in a way that's going to be productive. And so I'm going to 
take care of myself. I'm going to get to bed early. I love you very much. And I know that we're going to sort it out, but I need a bit more time. And Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's really self-compassionate, you know, Mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. a really, really, really good model for our children to like slow things down a bit. So is that needed with the Mm -hmm. like Lego tower thing? Probably not. Usually what happens when I'm able to like calm the kids, calm myself and then calm the kids down enough is that, you know, one child will say like, well, how about I finish building my tower and then he can have a turn with it? Or how about he uses the red one mm-hmm. or, you know, um, or, you know, one of the, like, I made up this little song in the summer that my kids now sing back to me, which is like, I can be flexible. <laughs> and uh-huh. so my two-year-old is really sweet. will sometimes say like, well, I can be flexible. I'll use the other one. And like flexible is a really important thing to practice. Mm-hmm. That is very mm-hmm. important to cohabitate with other people is to be flexible. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. So I don't know. I threw in a lot of different ideas there. But... Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I wanted to, you know, as I'm thinking parents listening to this, where there might be a little bit of a hang up where we could maybe give more clarification is you talked a lot about how we, uh, you know, the mindfulness piece of self-compassion, how we sit with uh, the moment that this is a difficult moment. Yeah. I think I think often parents, um, it's the whole thing about being present, right? It's if you're not a regular meditator, and even if you are, this is the constant challenge returning to the present moment. But I think what we do as parents so often is we we don't want to sit and humans, not just parents, all humans. So like we we think our feelings are an emergency. We don't want to sit with our feelings. We don't and being present with what is the mindfulness that this is really uncomfortable watching my kids argue. We don't want to sit with that. We want to skip past that to yeah. connecting with our child and then setting limits and problem solving. But those emotions are such a somatic experience in our bodies, right? And just like with our children, like we we do empathy because that empathy is the magic of it allows them to sit with the discomfort of the situation when the presence of a compassionate witness, right? But in that same context for parents, as they're like, they're hearing the fighting and they they need to go in and help with the children, how can we... Uh, support or what would be resourcing um, of that somatic experience so we can help them um, stay in that place a little longer so that it can, the feelings can be felt, right? And they can learn to dissipate. I don't, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, but yeah. yeah I, I do understand what you're saying. And I think like the somatic experience of emotion can be very intense and can come on yeah. really, really quickly in parenting because we have these other, like other humans that just like activated inside of us at inconvenient moments. Yeah. And, right. and so I think sometimes it's important, like for me, stepping outside really helps, you know? And so uh-huh. when, when we are, when there is not that, then again, and you mentioned it, but that mantra of like, this is not an emergency is a really mm-hmm. important one. Um, you know, I had actually this, this moment, this summer where I was solo with my four boys. We'd gone out for dinner and they had camp the next morning. We'd been like chronically up too late. And I was like, we need to get to bed in a good time this tonight to be able to go to school this morning or camp tomorrow morning. And, you know, we got home from a restaurant. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's already eight o'clock. And they're like fighting and being silly. And I went from like zero to 10 of feeling like, God, you're not listening. You're tired of bed. And I got so upset. And then I had to do like all this cleanup with them and me yelling and not wanting to yell. And it ended up being like harder and taking longer to get them to bed. And the next day when I was reflecting, I was like, it wasn't an emergency. Like it was a Sunday night in the summer. They had camp the next morning. We were talking about the difference between them being asleep at like 8.30 or 9.00 nobody's life was going to be like that different. If they just all gone Mm -hmm. to bed at nine, they were going to go to sleep. Like they've done every single night. And Mm -hmm. I was overwhelmed in that moment. And had I just let myself feel overwhelmed and actually like stepped away. Like, I think it, for me, I often want to like lean in and like, that's why I yell because I want to, I'm like, I need to do more to get rid of this big emotion. Right. Right. To fast forward through it. Just be quiet, (laughs) you know, like I'm overwhelmed. Just please be quiet. Um, And I wish if I could go back in time and do it again. And, you know, thankfully more often than not, I'm able to do this. Had I just like stepped outside, like they were running around being silly themselves. Nobody was in danger. They were all having fun. If I had just stepped outside for a second and just like taken a deep breath and been like, wow, I'm overwhelmed. Like it's really loud in there. (laughs) I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I have four children to get to sleep by myself and Mm -hmm. just like hand on heart, self-compassionate, tender, loving voice to myself of like, okay, 
this is an overwhelming moment. Like me and every other parent in the history of time who has felt overwhelmed by getting multiple children to bed at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get through this. I've gotten through this before. I can do this, you know? And then maybe there is even some of that like fierce self-compassion that's going to bring out action of like a, okay, maybe it would be helpful if I put on an audio story for this two of the kids. Will I get the other two ready? Like that could chunk it out a little bit, you know, like if I had just leaned out of the somatic experience Uh of being so overwhelmed and actually just like physiologically tried to calm myself down a little bit, I would have been able to tackle it and probably get them to bed earlier than losing my cool. So I think that reminder that it isn't an emergency and the stepping outside, another one that really works well is anything cold on your face or neck. It really like rewires the physiological response in your body. So like a bag of frozen Mm -hmm. peas on the back of your neck, a splash of cold water, even just like standing at the sink and like saying like, I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to drink this glass of water. I'm just going to drink this Mm -hmm. glass of water. I've also like put AirPods in my ears before and like listened to a song that just like allows me to get to a different place. Like music really releases different endorphins in your body. And sometimes if I put on like some like old school hip hop, and clean up my house. It's just so much more fun than doing it while you hear kids bickering, you know, like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. some of those, like, um, yeah, I I mean, I guess I'm, I'm both talking about the, like tending to and being with the big emotion. And then I'm also talking about some strategies to like help move through and release Mm -hmm. the somatic experience of the big emotion. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's the, in the moment. And then I think there is important work after the fact like before and after we'll put those in the same Mm -hmm. category. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. what are my big triggers? Why is it so upsetting to me when this happens? Like, why Mm -hmm. is, why does defiance make me see red? Red. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and how can I, like what happened when I was a child and I didn't listen or Mm -hmm. what my ideals about how a child should respond to a parent when a parent asks them to do something. Um, Or why is it that that one request that I like, why is it that when I ask my child to do his music practice, he always doesn't do it? Like, does he need more support to do his music practice? Is there some different way that we can integrate it into our routine to make it so that he actually does want to comply? Can I ask him? Can I talk to Mm -hmm. him about it? Like, sometimes I think there is actually work and that's why it's important to think of ourselves as the CEOs of our family and to put parenting as that big, important thing. Like you should see my to-do list of all the things that I want to do in our family. Like I'm trying, currently trying to like rejig our allowance system. And I'm thinking about whether our like screen time rules really are the right ones at this age and stage and routine in our family. Like it is real work. And that takes a Mm -hmm. lot of time. I'm really lucky. I recognize my luxury of being able to have the time to do that. But if it's just even finding the one thing that's Mm -hmm. burdening you the most, like what's weighing on me the most right now? Because it's pretty likely that if like your kids fighting yesterday sent you over the deep end, they're going to fight again tonight and it's going to send you over the deep end again. And Mm -hmm. so to just use self-compassion in the moment and not do the reflection before or after a challenging event, I think just really sets you up for failure and does a disservice. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a few very like practical strategies that I try to use to process my emotion as a parent. Like one is being in therapy. I think being in therapy or seeing a parent coach is really important. Like Mm -hmm. we are imperfect humans who've had an imperfect life. We've had our developed our own little list of both lowercase and uppercase traumas. Um, we have our triggers and like, you know, working through something individually, like the peaceful parent, happy kids workbook, or seeing a therapist, talking to a parent coach, writing in a journal, like these things really, really are important. Um, I find having a listening partner, a really amazing reflection because I thought, I I don't know why, but just at this busy stage of my life, it's easier than picking up a pen in my journal to just like hop on my phone and push record and vent about why it was so stressful that this thing happened and then like beautifully get to my own wise voice through reflecting. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it, yeah. we, mm-hmm. we can't do it without that, you know, and, mm. and we would offer our children the own, the same support with their big mm-hmm. emotions. You don't just like let them have a big emotion, let them have a challenging thing at school and then be like, okay, done. Never going to deal with that again. Like we're mm-hmm. going to, how did it go the next day with that friend? And like, 
what is it about that interaction that's the most challenging? And should, do you think I need to talk to the teacher? And are we going to like follow up with the pediatrician about this concern that we have, like we're constantly managing the big things that are coming up in their lives and we have to do the same for us. And so mm-hmm. I would encourage parents just to pick that one thing that's, you know, weighing on you the most or causing the most dysregulation and kind of try to like befriend it and untangle it a little mm-hmm. bit. So that when it bubbles up, you already have the resource of what you're going to do when it triggers you the next time. And the mantra that's going to help bring you back to choosing love and that interaction and the commitment to how you want to raise children that are emotionally intelligent. And you know, that happens by like being calm with them in the moment and that you already have the like picture on your fridge of the, your child, when they were a baby that you're going to look at when you can't find empathy, like give yourself the support that you need. And that, Mm -hmm. I think that is for your self-compassion, right? Because Mm-hmm. Self-compassion doesn't just mean like lying down and being loving and cozy towards yourself through all the hard parts of life. Yes, we need that, but we also need action. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we're only allowed to to move into action. We only can move into action productively, like from a good place of loving motivation when we've had the tender self, self-compassion. But we do need that beautiful balance of the fierce self-compassion that's like, what do I need to feel better in this moment, to function more well, to support my child? and like to, to honor that is something that you really need to do to put into place. Mm, so much great wisdom. I love that. Yes. All of it, all of it. And, um, <laughs> to, to wrap up, I, yeah, it reminds me of how peaceful parents often look for the need that's driving the child's behavior. And the same thing is what you're saying is we need to look at ourselves through the same lens. What is the need that's driving my own behavior? And then giving ourselves the empathy and the self-compassion, which is like the medicine on the wound that's there because those feelings are uncomfortable. We know that like, we don't want to feel them, but with self-compassion, we can feel them. And then, like you said, like in a sibling fight, once all the feelings have been heard, then you move into problem solving and the same thing for yourself. So, so many parallels in how we parent children with peaceful parenting and how we really need to structure our lives as parents if we want to be a leader, right? Because you can't just assume the position of leader without skills, resources, growth, learning, right? So like very similar templates of how we can do the same things with ourselves to to show up as the best version um, that we can. Um, Yeah, I love that. Like on this journey of being imperfect humans, right? Like, and, and, you know, I love that your company is called Delight in Parenting because like it is, there's joy in this work right. too. We've talked mm-hmm. about the harder moments, but if we give ourselves the support we need in those harder moments, then we there's more there's more light, there's more joy, right. there's abundance in the other right. part of it. And like parenting is hard and parenting can be fun and beautiful mm-hmm. and happy. And mm-hmm. so if it's not right now, you need more support for yourself mm-hmm. and for your family and it's out there and there's ways mm-hmm. to find it. And that's why I just love that you're doing this summit because self-compassion for me has been like the main support in bringing more joy and love into my family. So Mm -hmm. yes, I I love that. It's a pathway to delight, to creating more delight, not perfect delight, but more often than not, because life is short. We make the best of it. How can we increase the ratio of positive versus challenging situations? And exactly. Love that. Yeah. I love that you mentioned resourcing ourselves. Would you like to talk a little bit about the freebie for our audience as well before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. I'd love anybody to head over to my website. I'm going to have a meditation there for anybody who wants to sign up for my newsletter. It's the How Human of Me meditation, something that I say to myself and find really helpful for parents. Mm -hmm. And so I Mm -hmm. hope it's supportive for other people too. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much, Leslie. I really appreciate your time and all of your expertise and wisdom shared today. So (laughs) great talking to you, Diana. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.